Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I've always loved the beach. There's just something so calming and peaceful about listening to the waves crash and feeling the warm sand between my toes. So when I inherited a cute little beach cottage from my grandparents, I was over the moon. The house sat right on the edge of the dunes, just steps away from the shoreline. It was small, just two tiny bedrooms and one bathroom, but it had the most amazing views. I spent every free moment I had there, soaking up the sun and enjoying the laid-back, carefree beach lifestyle. That all changed when Karen moved in next door. Karen was, well, a piece of work, to put it mildly. She seemed friendly enough at first when she introduced herself. A little overbearing, maybe, but nothing too crazy. Oh, how wrong I was. The requests started off innocently enough. Can I borrow some butter? Do you have any eggs I could use? No problem. I was happy to help out a neighbor. But then Karen started asking for bigger and bigger favors. One day she asked if some friends of hers could use my house for the weekend while I was out of town. That made me a little uncomfortable, but she swore up and down they'd be super careful and leave everything exactly as they found it. Against my better judgment, I reluctantly agreed. Big mistake. Huge. When I came back, my cute beach cottage was completely trashed. Empty beer cans and trash were strewn everywhere. There was a huge red stain on the rug, my guess is wine, and my couch was sliced open with stuffing coming out. Lovely. I was livid. This was not at all what I had agreed to. I stormed over to Karen's place, ready to give her a piece of my mind, but before I could knock, I heard laughing and music coming from inside. Curious, I peeked in the window. My blood boiled. There were a bunch of people, none of whom I recognized, partying it up in my beach house. They were playing loud music, doing keg stands, grinding on my furniture. It was like an episode of Jersey Shore. I banged on the door until a very drunk, very angry guy answered. What do you want? He slurred. Um, hi, this is my house that you're destroying. I'm gonna need you guys to leave, now. Drunk dude looked at me like I was nuts. Nah, this is my boy Lenny's beach crib. Karen gave it to him for the weekend. Now I was seeing red. That little weasel. Karen had given away access to my house without even asking me. I told drunk dude that it was absolutely my property and if he didn't get his buddies out right this second, I was calling the cops. That seemed to sober him up quick. He started rounding people up, apologizing profusely. I watched from the sidewalk as the parade of drunk college kids filed out, tossing their empty cups in my grass. Unbelievable. Once the last straggler was gone, I burst into my house to survey the damage. It was ten times worse than after Karen's first friend group. There was trash everywhere, visible stains on all my furniture, and a mysterious wet spot on the ceiling that I didn't even want to think about. I wondered if my security deposit would even begin to cover all of this. As I stared open-mouthed at the ruins of my beloved beach cottage, I heard Karen's voice behind me. Oh, good, you're back. Did Lenny and his friends have an awesome time or what? I whirled around, absolutely seething. Are you kidding me, Karen? You gave away access to my house without even asking me. Do you see what they did to this place? Karen blinked at me innocently. But I thought you said it was totally fine for friends to use your place when you're gone. I meant my friends! Not dozens of drunken idiots who trash the entire house. Karen waved her hand flippantly. Oh, don't be so dramatic. Just a little spilled beer never hurt anyone. I wanted to strangle her. Listen, I said through gritted teeth. If you ever give anyone access to my house again without my permission, I am calling the cops and pressing charges. Karen's eyes flashed dangerously. For a second, I thought she might actually take a swing at me, but she quickly composed herself. You're making a big mistake she said coldly before marching back to her place. Something about her tone made a chill run down my spine. This wasn't over. The next day I came back from getting some cleaning supplies to find two cop cars parked in my driveway. My stomach dropped. I had a bad feeling I knew who had called them. Are you the owner of this residence? One of the officers asked me. I confirmed that yes, this was indeed my property. Well, we got a call reporting a squatter at this address. The caller claimed that she owned this home and that you were illegally trespassing here. I nearly exploded right there. That unbelievable psycho. Thankfully, I had all my documentation proving home ownership. After reviewing my paperwork, the cops determined that I was in the right and Karen was just being a vindictive jerk. They left after making sure I was the only one staying there. 
I wished I could celebrate my victory, but this meant war as far as I was concerned. Karen wanted to play dirty? Oh, honey, it was on now. I installed security cameras outside my house and made sure they captured Karen's front door. I wasn't going to let her try anything else without proof. Sure enough, a few nights later I checked the footage and caught Karen red-handed snooping around my windows and trying my door handle. I forwarded the video straight to the police and she was arrested for trespassing. While sweet Karen was locked up, I took the opportunity to file a lawsuit against her for unlawfully giving access to my property. The judge took one look at the state of my trashed cottage and ruled fully in my favor. Karen was forced to pay me back for all the damages. Let's just say after all that, Karen stayed far, far away from me and my beach house. The place needed some serious TLC after her shenanigans, but at least now I could relax without worrying about that psycho neighbor. The sound of the waves and the salty air soothed my soul once again. Peace and quiet at last. The next one is a pro-revenge story. Several years ago, I went to work for a towing company. It's about all I know how to do other than paint cars, which is drastically affecting my health. The pay was pretty decent, but we had to share trucks, and the boss felt that he knew where we needed to sit in order to get the best calls. This is important for later. Several months in, I realized that I was not making the type of money that I should be making. So I took the opportunity while I was sitting in a parking lot one evening to start researching the laws pertaining to employees in similar positions. He was kind of an a-hole, and the trucks had transponders so that he could see if we had them idling with the air conditioner on on a hot day, or idling with the heat on on a cold day. He was always calling and complaining about something if the wheels were not turning. During my research, I discovered that if he was requiring us to sit in a certain parking lot, street, or any location of his choosing, then we were entitled to be paid an hourly wage, not just our commission. The technical term was engaged to wait. However, if he allowed us to freely roam about while we waited for calls, we were not entitled to hourly wages, and we were therefore considered waiting to be engaged. I never mentioned this to him, but I did start taking note of my time. Another month or so went by, and he decided to start coming down on me for tiny little BS things that ordinarily wouldn't even matter, such as me forgetting a pop can in the cup holder. He actually had a screaming fit about that. At this point, I was tired of working there and had already found another job, so I decided it was time to put my plan into motion. I called him up, told him that we needed to have a conversation about my final wages, and that we could meet at his convenience. Upon entering the office, I laid out my argument, explained the state law, and told him I expected to be paid for the hours that I was on the clock but not freely allowed to roam looking for work, or able to do things of my choosing. He told me in no uncertain terms that I would not be paid for that time, as that was agreed upon upon my employment. I did not bother to argue, as I already had my next step planned, so I took my final check and left. The following Monday I made a phone call to the State Labor Board, where I laid out my case to them. Needless to say, they were very interested in what was going on. In the end, they came to review his employment records and speak to the drivers still working. When he got the bill for what he had to pay us all, it was too much for him to afford. So he sold the trucks, his boat, and the lot, and went out of business. I never got the money owed to me in full, only a fraction. But the satisfaction of knowing the law just a little bit better than he did, and watching it all burn, was pure bliss. The next one is a petty revenge story. I want to start with, I love dogs. I've had dogs for 80% of my life, and I absolutely love them. However, I don't currently have a dog. Keeping that in mind, here's my story. I just started living in this nice suburb at the beginning of this year. It's a quiet area, and my girlfriend and I really like it here. But there's a neighborhood Karen. She's your stereotypical retired woman just trying to find something to do with her day. And what she does is walk around the area complaining. Her complaints can be about anything, and everything. And most of the time, she leaves a note in people's mailboxes. I've received many of these notes with comments like, your grass is too long, or your car is dirty, etc. But when it comes to dogs, she loves to call either the police or code enforcement. A co-worker friend of mine lives close by, and Karen has called the police or whoever on his dog many times. There have even been a few fines handed out for things like dog at large, so sometimes you choose a plan, and sometimes a plan chooses you. In mid-October, I was shopping with my brain firmly in low-power mode. I saw a shelf of warning signs, including beware of large dog, 
and the word large caught my eye and got my brain moving. Thoughts like, if I put this up, can I fool her? And if I do this, will I be a neighborhood hero? In the end, I decided that not all heroes wear capes and put up the signs in front of my house. It took a few days for me to notice Karen looking at my signs and then start staring at my house. Or at least it took me a while to realize that she was somewhat stalking my home. Some days she's subtle, and on others, she kind of does a wandering thing where she's pretty much pacing the area. About three weeks after putting up the signs, I was shopping at my local Goodwill, because I'm classy like that, and I saw a three-foot dog chain for two dollars. I was hatching my plan before I even had it in my hand. So there was a chain, but no collar, and clearly I needed a big, big collar. I couldn't find a big collar, but I did find a woman's belt. It's thick with square studs on it, so it kind of looks like a collar for a large dog or maybe a small horse. I hope no one saw me on my drive home. I had the most evil smile on my face the whole time, so the collar and chain hung by the door for when I would need them. My girlfriend has been rolling her eyes at me through all of this, but she has put up with weirder things from me, so she's fine. After four days on the hook, I saw Karen down the street. I raced for the door and grabbed the collar with the manic glee of a child at Christmas. When Karen walked by, she saw me holding this monster collar, yelling, Baskerville! Baskerville, come here, boy! Followed by lots of whistling and wandering around looking behind my car, among other things. Karen saw this, and her eyes went wide with pure but silent terror. I started to smile, so I used my hands to cup my mouth and kept calling for Baskerville while walking behind my house. I was holding in my laughter so hard I may have gotten a hernia, but if I did, it was worth it. I have done this same thing five times in the last few weeks, and it's still as fun as the first time. I'm pretty sure I've wasted 14 afternoons of this woman's life, she has spent so much time trying to catch my beloved Baskerville at something she can call the cops on. So far, no one has come to my house like a cop or whatever, and I'm pretty sure Karen has caught on to what I'm doing. But I only spent $20 on the signs and collar belt, so I feel like I got my money's worth. The next one is a malicious compliance story. So just to be clear, this is an ongoing issue, compliance. So no nice resolution just yet. But if folks want, I can update when more happens. Also, for clarity, I live in the U.S., so no universal health care and a lot of out-of-pocket medical expenses. So to start, over the past 12 months, I've had to, on three separate occasions, get different medication tests done. The first two were blood tests four months apart due to different concerns, and another for a non-blood test. What I didn't know was that there were significant out-of-pocket costs for each of these tests, like almost $300 each time that I wasn't informed of until I got the bill. Well... Being paid in a high cost of living city because of my career choice, on top of student loan payments starting back up, and a few unexpected expenses popping up. This was going to be hard to pay off. That's when I decided to apply for a financial assistance program through my insurance. Now you would think having such a program would be nice of my insurance, which sounds not even close to Pfizer temporary, and that's what I thought too. So I requested an application, filled it out, and mailed it in back in June. Got a confirmation message on my insurance's app that they had gotten the application and to give them 21 business days to review it. I figured, okay, I can wait, and wait I did, and waited and waited. Finally, in mid-August, I figured I'd check up on the application. And after being bounced around in the phone triage, I finally got to someone in customer services at insurance that doesn't remotely sound like Pfizer temporary who could give me an answer. Their answer? Oh, we never got your proof of income as requested, so we closed out the application. What request? We sent out a letter asking you to submit proof of income, but since we never got a response, we closed out the application. Mind you, this is not a request listed in the initial application form, nor had I ever gotten a letter or email, call, or even smoke signal from them informing me that they needed this info. But I never got this letter. Well, we sent it out in July. But I never got it. Can you guys please resend me this letter and email it to me again and not close out my application? As soon as I get it, I'll send you the info. So I would know where to send it, slash slash attach it to the email. The representative agreed, and you would think I'd get the email and the letter, I submit my pay stubs, end of the story. Well, you're wrong because guess what email never came in? Checked and rechecked and was chronically refreshing my email inbox and my junk folder. No email came in. So a few days later, I called again. 
Guess who claimed again that they sent the email, which, once again, I never got. Guess who had to call three more times in order to get someone to submit the email while I was on the phone with them before I got the X email. So I finally got the email, attached my pay stubs to the email, and sent it back. Surely I'm done now? Nope. Within a week of doing this, I finally got the paper letter requesting the info. One day later, I got a paper letter saying because I never sent them my pay stubs, so they were closing out my application again. Well, as anyone at this point saying I was frustrated and pissed would not cover it. Keep in mind, I still all this time having to make attempts to pay off my medical bills, and it's during this time that the third test had to be done. So the bill grew even higher. I was told that this test was covered by my insurance. Clearly, that was not true. So I called again to file a complaint this time, and to see what the heck was going on. The duckers claimed I never emailed them back with my pay stubs and I would have to reapply. I was even told at one point, in reference to my complaint, I don't know what you are asking me to do, after I clearly told them why I was upset at this point. So I have to, at this point, reapply? Okay, I'll reapply and make sure this time there is absolutely no way you can say you never got my application. I went and printed off a month's worth of pay stubs and printed off ten copies each. Have to be sure I don't forget those again, right? I then printed off ten applications, filled them all out, including recalculating how much out-of-pocket medical expenses I've had in the last 12 months. Oh, that test I had after I submitted my application the first time? Can't forget to add that. Oh, I had to refill my prescription and had a copay, better include that too. By the end, the amount listed was more than $200 more than what it was when I first did the application. Now to make sure they get it. Now that following Monday, I went into the post office and asked for 10 stamps and to send something via certified mail. Less than $12 to enact my compliance. Every day for that week, a letter, numbered on the envelope, an application went out. The same exact application, signed and dated for the same day, same numbers, the only thing different is the number on the back of the envelope and that on Monday I sent the first one via certified letter. Next Monday rolls around and not a peep from Visor Temporary. Oh, let's make sure all five letters didn't get lost in the mail. Another certified letter? Five more envelopes and applications with all the same information ready to go? Today I finally got a response via email. Thank you for your application. Please allow us 30 days to review your request. Oh, but this is pretty close to what they said last time. I can't stop sending them in. How will I know for sure they got all the info they needed this time? That is, until they finally approve my application for financial help like they should have done back in July. The next one is an entitled people story. About eight months ago, I started essentially full-time helping my dad as his health problems worsened with age. He has had mobility problems and relies on a cane walker. He also has a degree of heart failure and kidney disease. He was in the hospital several times earlier in the year, and since then, I essentially gave up my apartment to come and help him. For me, it was always going to be temporary, never a permanent, long-term situation. However, I have been here for almost a year and have been helping him full-time. I handle meals, grocery shopping, house upkeep, taking him to medical appointments, laundry, and dishwasher duties. I do pretty much everything, including clearing his dishes to ensure his comfort. One of the biggest issues he has is control over finances. He likes to feel needed and has been giving me $500 per month for the time I've been here. If you were to hire a caretaker, they would charge that amount per week, probably. I let it slide for a long time, but it has bothered me. Several months ago, I brought it to his attention and told him I'm not comfortable with that amount anymore. I explained that I've essentially given up my life to look after him, and he dismissed it at the time. About a week ago, we had an argument because I told him I planned to leave this fall. I could tell he was trying to act like his ego wasn't hurt and he was fine with it, although he obviously wants me to continue helping him at the small rate I am. During this argument, he said some hurtful things to me. He expressed that he wished I and my sister were never born and that I was the biggest regret of his life. Obviously, these are very hurtful things to say. After this happened, I stopped helping him altogether. He was able to start making himself a sandwich for dinner and doing basic meal prep, and I haven't lifted a finger. Each day he has tried to talk to me about it, even yesterday offering me money to go out and get him dinner. I told him no, and then I laid out my terms, which he hasn't agreed to. Of course, his ego got hurt again, so he went out and got food for himself. 
Today I had a moment where I emotionally caved. I got angry because he doesn't seem to be budging and can't simply treat me with respect. I told him that it's pretty amazing he would rather be stubborn than admit he needs my help and is willing to compensate me fairly and treat me properly. Whenever I've brought up compensation, he always says that everyone he knows has their children help them without caring about money. I, 32F, have sacrificed a lot to be here helping him, but he doesn't seem to care because he always acts like I'm lucky to be here, not the other way around. At this point, it's been probably five or six days, and I haven't done any meal prep, shopping, or any other chores. I have been searching for a new apartment for several weeks now. I went to see one, and I'm continuing to look for a way out of this situation. In the meantime, it's difficult because I am financially dependent on him, and he uses this to essentially withhold money that I feel is owed to me given everything I've done. I have done the research, and the average caretaker receives between $1,500 and $2,500 a month. I would even be willing to accept $1,000 a month in the interim while I am still here. He has the finances, but simply doesn't want to do it out of principle and control. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.